Judiciary Committee has completed its hearing for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. I enjoyed meeting the nominee. I went into the Senate's process with an open mind. But after studying the nominee's record and watching her performance this week, I cannot and will not support Judge Jackson for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. All is my life I has to fight hitters. All is my life I hard times like yeah, bad trips like yeah, Nazareth. I'm on one, homie. You on one, but if God got us, then we gonna be alright. Open unto me, open unto me, light from my darkness. Open unto me, courage from my fear. Open unto me, hope from my despair. Open unto me, peace from my turmoil. Open unto me, joy from my sorrow. Open unto me, strength from my weakness. Open unto me, wisdom from my confusion. Open unto me, forgiveness from my sins. Open unto me, tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me, love for my haste. Open unto me, thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Amen.
The scripture reading is taken from 1 Samuel 16, 9 through 13, 7 through 13. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse, then Jesse called to Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he, had, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David Samuel then went to Ramah.
BC. Uh, it's a blessing to be here with you uh, this morning. Anytime I'm behind this sacred desk, I, I'm always honored and humbled uh, by the opportunity. I just want to say first, thank you. You know, you saw some new, not new faces, but uh, some younger faces this morning. I want to say thank you to uh, Mackenzie, Ezra, Elijah, Isaiah. You know, we want to be so intentional with the work that we do here in the ministry. So fourth Sunday, you're going to see uh, some younger faces. We're going to talk about young adults, young people. This is what we want to make sure our fourth Sunday is targeted for. Uh, so I want to say thank you for them doing incredible, incredible, incredible things. Uh, just uh, the uh, but a little month ago, uh, we found out that Isaiah would be uh, playing football for Union College in New York. We're so grateful uh, for that. But and also, we heard just the other week um, that Florida Avenue's own uh, Tiana Walker, uh, she has a residency at Harvard. And God is doing incredible. Yes, Harvard. God is doing some incredible work here uh, at Florida Avenue uh, with our young people. So we want to say um, that we're so proud of you, the work that you're doing. Um, you're wearing the FABC badge incredibly. So just thank God for you uh, this morning. Listen. Amen. I believe there is a word from the Lord. There's a word. So much has happened this week. Uh, somebody who transpired here in Washington, yes, uh, with Judge Jackson, uh, Katanji Jackson. I'm excited because she's from Miami. Uh, can we just give God glory for uh, that sister standing her ground this week? Uh, just was incredible. Um, but I'm so excited. I'm just fired up uh, because God is shifting the atmosphere. Uh, and this week was an incredible uh, moment for that. Now, listen, before we get started, um, I want to just read verses 10 through 13 again, uh, verses 10 through 13, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16. I'm just going to read 10 through 13 uh, out of the NIV. The reading of the word, of the word says, a Jesse had seven of his sons pass, from, pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen the, these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They are still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. As Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Verse 12 says, so he sent for him and had him brought in, and he was glowing with health and a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went to Ramah. The Lord had a blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers of his word. Lord, let you talk. Let your people receive it. And let this message be blessed. Amen. Uh, this year, our pastor has set the theme for the church. The theme for the church is living in the spirit by the power of his grace. And that's the theme that he set out for 2022. It's living in the spirit by the power of his grace. And there's, so, there's no one who exemplifies the grace of God like David. David, though when we speak of David, we talk about his kingship, his lineage, his ability to slay giants. But David was a broken man. David struggled with his flesh. David struggled with his sin. And though he was mighty, dare I said he operated in a state of depression operated in a state of depression. This, this, this state of depression is, is where I say that just for a moment in which I, I was having a conversation with many of my colleagues just uh, the other week, and we talked about how many of us are operating in a state of depression. Operating in a state of depression uh, where we uh, have a smile on our face and we, we look good and we're able to continue on what God is charging us to be, but still we're operating in a place of depression. And we see this in songs, and you go throughout songs, and you see how David was able to still champion on, because in spite of all of this, the Bible states that David was a man after God's own heart. 
However, as great as David was, as mighty as we was, uh, what we see in the text, it wasn't always this way. He wasn't the hand-picked choice to be the king when nominated by the universe's, the universe's president, which was God. Uh, he wasn't taken serious when that first nomination came by. And I know when I talk about nominations and presidents, it may be triggering. Because we just watched the most qualified justice nominee ever stand trial for over 40 hours as if she didn't go to Harvard Law School. Stand trial for over 40 hours as if she didn't work for the Supreme Court clerkship or spent time at prestigious corporations or also served on the federal judiciary seat in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Just like David in the text we saw just this week, you could be qualified but undervalued. But I got news for, for, for those haters. I got news for the Republicans. I got news for folks like Mitch McConnell. What God has ordained, no man can stop. Now I'm back in the text. I'm back in the text and we see that the text, David is tending the sheep. He's out in the sheep pasture working the field and doing the assignment of his father in the sun working, in the rain working, in the snow working. And David is out in the pasture keeping eye on the sheep and the smell is strong. His clothes is dirty, but he's on assignment. Folks have to sit back and realize what does it mean to Work the sheep. Everybody now, we, we, we in the church, we've been so okay and ease to talk about what it means to be a shepherd. But during these times, uh, being a shepherd was a job that nobody really wanted. Being out in the pasture, walking and smelling like sheep manure, nobody wanted this job. While he was working in the pasture, sweating, dirty, God sends a messenger named Samuel to pick David to be his king. I don't know about you, but this resonated with me because society has told us that we have to be perfect, that we have to come from prestigious schools in affluent neighborhoods, but uh, we have to be married or we have to have kids in or out of wedlock. We have to have a certain time that we have kids. We have to have the grades or go to college. But what I found about David to be true is God will find you in the mud. Uh, David, David uh, was doing the work and God found him ten toes in the mud and, and he found him tending the sheep. He found him tending the sheep. I, I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but uh, if you haven't had the smoothest journey, uh, don't have all the accolades, don't uh, have all the, the prestigious things that they say you should have. You've been the black sheep in your family. You may have had uh, not your fair share of, of great moments in your life, or you may have some mistakes, but in reality, you still are God's handpicked. I've come to tell you that in spite of it all, I've come to inspire you. In spite of what you don't have, in spite of the mistakes that you have made in your life, you're worthy of the crown. Yes, you're flawed, but the crown is still yours. Yes, uh, you don't have the credentials, but the crown is still yours. Yes, your tongue may slip from speaking in tongues to cussing folks out, but the crown is still yours. I wish we had a full church connect. I would say, turn to your neighbor and say, the crown is still yours. But don't miss this today. Don't miss this. Because when God makes the decision, it, it isn't about placement, but it's about assignment. And we can all be in the same place, in the same building, but we all don't have the same assignment. So it doesn't matter where you're placed in your timeline of life. It doesn't matter uh, what situation you find yourself in. God will crown you because he has a divine assignment for you. Divine assignment. You're qualified wherever you are. You're qualified when you're in your season of money and your season of broke. You're qualified and you're in your season of good help 
or your season of illness. You're qualified in your season of with or without. Wherever your situation is, God says, you're qualified. But I know a few people online and in the building that can give the testimony to say that God has qualified me to be in some rooms that I felt I didn't deserve. God has qualified me to be some places where I felt like I didn't have the credentials. God has qualified me to have access to programs that I know I didn't check the box off. No matter where you are, you're qualified. You're qualified. I'm not qualified because I came from the best neighborhood, the best home, have the best job, drive the, the best car. I'm qualified because in spite of all those things that you think that it, those are qualifiers, God still covers me. You know why he covers me? Because grace is sufficient. I can sit down because that grace part, that's the, the bridgement of the text. That, that, that grace part, this is, it's not about us, but it's about who God qualifies. And God alone is the one that places the crown on our head. I'm um, saying it again, it's, it's not the place of who qualifies, but God alone who, who qualifies us. And you should be excited because you know that God, in spite of your flaws, God, in spite of what you did last night, God, in spite of living in this judgmental world, God, in spite of you falling for the same shortcoming sins, God, in spite of how you feel right now, God said you still have the crown. So we look at the text, and I won't be before you long, and there's a few principles that I want you to glean from with this text that will help you grow or will help stretch someone that's close to you. And what I love about the text is that we serve a God that in spite of what others may think, their vote does not hold weight against God. I'm going to say it again. What I love about the text is that no matter what others th- Others may a vote and the others may think against you. It doesn't hold weight. Because the beauty is that they can't outvote God. I, I, I was frustrated when I heard that Mitch McConnell stood up just after seeing our dear sister shed tears because of the experience she's had to go through. And he stood up and said that he cannot and will not vote for her. But I was encouraged because I realized that he alone can't stop the vote. And just like it in your life, there's some folks that's going to go against you. There's some folks that going to have their name attached to you and going to ridicule you. But them alone, they can't stop what God has for you. So we see in the text, we see here that Samuel has this burden on him. The prophet Samuel has a burden on him. Because now he has to pick the next king. So Samuel, he first, he picked Saul. He first, he picked Saul to be king. And Saul was a man that was tall in stature. Saul was a king's king. What happens, and we see in verses 15 and 16, is that God got tired of Saul. Saul, he starts smelling himself, and he thought it was because of his own might. And, And God told Samuel, he said, listen, I'm about to switch some things up. Now, the thing about it is Saul is still king. Saul is still operating as king. But behind the scenes, God was still orchestrating the next kingship. And then sometimes I want to encourage you. Sometimes the situation may seem as it's never going to change. But God is behind the scenes orchestrating the new season. And so he tells Samuel, I need you to go out so that you can pick the next king. So he goes out, he meets Jesse. And Jesse, Jesse, the the Bible doesn't tell us much about Jesse. But scholars and theologians talk about Jesse. Jesse was a guy who had to be well respected within the community. Jesse had a house full of boys, and it was seven boys, and the opportunity of just having one of your boys. Be king was a blessing. So Samuel comes in the house. And he tells Jesse, I'm here to pick a king. Jesse goes and he grabs his boys and he goes oldest to youngest. 
So Samuel initially, uh, Samuel uh, wanted to pick the oldest son based on his stature because it reminded him of Saul. You see, just like Samuel, many of us, we, we, we pray about things. We, uh, we, we love to say we're blessed, highly favored. God is moving through us. But even in our sanctified selves, we make wrong decisions. This is the prophet that was handpicked by God to pick the next king, but he made a decision based upon what the previous king looked like. So, so the Bible tells us that Samuel goes up to the first son and gets ready to anoint him as king because he said, this has to be the king. And God stops him right there. God stops him right there. He tells him that this is not the king. God had to get Samuel straight because God told Samuel, don't get caught up on the world's criteria because man looks on the outer appearance, but I look on the heart. And if there's plenty of folks who have been elected and have positions who look the part, but baby, they don't have no heart. Folks that look like they should be elected, folks that look like they should be standing behind podium, folks that look like they should be head of organizations, but they have no heart for the people they're called to serve. So, 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 so God is, uh, had to get Samuel right. We serve a God who isn't caught up on the spiritual facade, the mask you wear, but God cares about the words you say when it's just you. God cares about Choosing folks who don't look good on paper, but God cares about folks who have a good heart for his people. God cares about your heart. And to my daters, to my ladies, to my fellas, the next time you choose a brother or a sister, you better look behind all that fluff, all that game they throwing. And you got to say, I got to get a heart check. Because if, if the heart is bad, if their heart isn't pure, if their heart doesn't have respect for women, if their heart don't have respect for black men, the reality is it won't work. I'm going to say that again. If, if the heart isn't pure, if the heart lacks respect, it, it won't work. I don't care how good it drives. I don't care how good it looks, how good it smells, how good it feels. If the heart isn't there, it, it, it won't work. Uh, somebody say, check your heart. Check, check, check your heart. So Jesse brings out his sons one by one. Jesse asks about his sons and has to be one of these. Interesting thing is Samuel knows that God didn't send him, him there for no reason. Samuel says, this is all of you, children. And Jesse forgets he has a son out in the pasture. Jesse says, uh, I got one boy. He's short. I got one boy. He, he's not the best in the classroom. I got one boy. Grew up in a single pair home. I, I got one boy. He, he got a record. Uh, he, he's out in the pasture. Samuel says, go out and get him. I'm not leaving until I meet him. I don't want you to miss this. I, I promise, I, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. David is working the field while the conversation is happening in the house. David's working the field as the conversation about his future is taking place in the house. David is sweating. David is tired. He's watching the sheep. He's making sure the pasture is right. He, he, he's sick and tired. He's out working the field while God is orchestrating his kingship. The question I have this morning to my young people it's what would have happened if David would have quit? What, what, what would have happened if David said that he was tired of working the field? 
What would happen if David would have showed up late that morning and Samuel would have came to the house and he wasn't there? What I love about the text here is that it shows us that David was in his divine place in his divine assignment. Now listen, every place that you are working, it may not be what you want it to be, but God wants you to pull something out of that environment. I know it doesn't feel good. I know you're tired. I know you're waiting for God to shift you into the next season, but don't worry. Keep working the pasture. Keep working the pasture. So many times we tell God, we say, God, I I'm going to be faithful once my next season comes. I'm going to be faithful when that next job comes. I'm going to be faithful when that next person comes in my life. I'm going to be faithful once we get back to the church. But can you be faithful when you're out in the pasture? Can you be faithful when there's no support? Can you be faithful when there's some church or family hurt? Can you be faithful when you don't get paid? Can you be faithful when even your loved ones hurt you? Can you be faithful when you don't hear from God? Can you be faithful when you pray for things and you see the opposite happen? Can you be faithful when you're out in the pasture? And David is out in the pasture while the house negro, I'm sorry, his brothers are in the house lined up trying to take his crown. But baby, can I tell you something this morning? That no matter how many brothers are in the house, no matter how many people are in front of you, that crown is tailor-made just for you. It's tailor-made just for you. The text tells us that when he goes outside, he sends David, sends for David. And when he sees David, the Lord says, rise and anoint him. This is the one. The Bible tells us that Samuel took the horn again and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I don't want you to miss that. He he says, when when he saw him, God said, That's him. The Bible tells us that he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. He he, he anointed him in the presence of folks that talked about him. He anointed him in the presence of folks that got blessed before him. He, He anointed him in the presence of folks that tried to oppress him. He anointed him in the presence of folks that talked about him. The Bible tells us that he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Why does this matter, Brother Van? Because God wants you to know that your private sacrifice is going to be a public elevation. I'm going to say that God wants you to know your private tears, your your private struggles, your private hurdles that you have to do. God said, I'm grooming you for a public elevation. So he he sees he sees a brother get anointed. And I, I, I can only imagine I can only imagine how they feel. You're the tallest, you're the oldest. It chiseled but yet, David, you got all the credentials. David, if I had time, this is a different sermon, but if I had time, I would preach to those brothers. Because what happens when you're qualified but God still doesn't choose you? But I don't have time. So they, they see his brother get anointed with oil and I'm done 
and they see it get anointed with oil. And it says that the spirit of God reigned with him from that day on. The spirit of God reigned on him when that oil touched him. The spirit of God was with him when he was with Bathsheba. The, the spirit of God was with him when he had folks killed. The spirit of God was still with him all the days of his life. Man, you got me caught up. What, 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 what do you mean by that? Why, why, why you didn't just tell us? The spirit of God was with him when he reigned king, when when he blessed the Lord, why, why did you say the Spirit was with him in those moments of despair? Because the reality of it is, no matter what you have in your future that may be a hurdle, God still got you qualified because the oil is deep. And I don't know who I come here to preach to today, but you're asking God, where are you, God? Where, where are you in this moment, God? Do you, do you feel me, God? And God said, don't worry, this oil is still deep. I apologize. I, 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 uh, I didn't give you the title. And it messed up. He's dirty. He smells like manure. The real ish has hit the fan. But uh, he's worthy of the crown. He, he, he's worthy of the crown. I've come to tell you that you're worthy of the crown. No matter what that brother did to you, no matter what that sister may have done to you, no matter what school feels like, no matter what your job may feel like, you're worthy of the crown. I know you may have those ailments, but you're worthy of the crown. I just want to encourage somebody, wherever you are, you're asking God, do you hear me? God, do you, do you see me? God is saying, you're worthy of the crown. My oil runs deep. You're qualified. This, this sermon was built out of watching our sister this week. Standing someplace where you know black folks, we always stood places. We got to be 10 times better. Still to be questioned if we're good enough. We've seen our black sisters got to work 10 times harder just to show that they should get equal pay. It was this year, this year, I apologize to our sisters. It was this year that I truly understood what equal pay day was all about. Equal pay day switches dates from year to year. So realize what equal pay day is, is it's the day in which women will have to work just to have the same salary of their male counterparts from the year before. And I'm sitting here, I'm learning all of this. God encouraged our sister. We're sitting in the Cory book and he tells her, he says, I want you to know, as tears is going down Judge Kentangi Jackson's face, he said that you're qualified. You're worthy. And God has come to tell you this morning, with tears coming down your face, with bills and all the things that's happening, you're qualified, you're worthy, you're ordained, you're anointed. That's all. So it doesn't matter what your situation may look like. It, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what folks said about you. God vote reigns supreme. So Mitch, do what you do. Republicans can say what they want to say. But in the coming weeks, she will be confirmed. The devil is at your door. It feels like he's in your house. But God say, hold tight in your pasture. Because in a few moments, your anointing and your confirmation will come. Those that have ears, let them 
here. Now, wherever you are, the doors of the church are now open. It's my prayer that something that was said, something that was read, sung this morning, it touches you and transforms you. Listen, we're in some um, trying and difficult times. You shouldn't go another day without knowing God for yourself. Young people, listen. I say this with chills going down my back. There was a 14-year-old in Orlando, Florida, on a ride, having the time of his life. In less than 60 seconds, his entire life was gone. Young kid that was shot in Chicago. Young kid that was shot in D.C. just two months ago. Middle school. His life going just like that. I'm not saying you should know the entire Bible. If I may be frank, folks in their 70s and 80s are still having that struggle. But pray. If you just need one scripture, just know Jesus wept. And why did he weep? He wept because he feels what you're going through. He wept because he saw Lazarus and the compassion that folks had for him. He wept because just as much as he's divine, he's human as well. So God knows what you're going through. I'm young. King Josiah was young too. But God ordained and qualified him. All you have to do is believe that he died on the cross but that he rose with all power in his hand so that you may have eternal life yes you if you're looking for a church home this is the place for you email the church looking to give pastor assist at aol.com Visit our website, floridaavenue.org. God is doing incredible work in this place. I'm going to give you a great example when I'm out of here. Great example here is, what does it mean to work the passion? What does it mean to just work and wait for God to confirm you? Just a couple weeks ago, we had the opportunity to meet Secretary of Energy. And just two weeks before, a couple of weeks before they contacted our pastor, he had us on the phone talking about preparing ourselves to do solar, to talk about solar, preparing ourselves to do energy. Just this past week, we had an opportunity to meet with Holy Trinity. God is doing incredible things within this city. He's doing it through our church. You know why he's doing it? Because we're in the pasture working. We were in the right place at the right time. The secretary was able to call our church. That doesn't happen if we quit. It doesn't happen if we don't tap in and lock in. But we're in the pasture working. Father, right now, God, we pray that you would be with us. Now, it's one thing to preach about David in the pasture, God, but God, David's pasture sometimes is a place that we feel detached from. Because sometimes, God, we ask, where are you when we're dealing with death, God? Where are you when we're dealing with illness, God? Where are you when we're trying to figure out how we're going to pay the next bills. God, where are you when we look at the gas prices and one month I was paying $30, but now I'm paying $50. True story, God. We're trying to figure out where are you. But folks, 
and Ukraine are getting billions of dollars in aid, but yet we just blocked off Haitians for getting to this country. God, where are you? In a city where teachers have to buy their own glue and pencils for their students, but yet we're investing more and more into the police force, preparing to lock our kids up but not excelling them. God, we ask the question, where are you? So God, we pray that you will do a divine thing. Confirm the crown that we wear. Be with every kid that's right, watching this right now, every young person, God. If they're not watching, God, I pray, God, that you will be with the parent, God, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle that's watching, God. Protect them, God, from all hurt, harm, and danger. Protect them, God, from the things that they cannot see. Order their steps. We'll forever give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, as always, be grateful. Be intentional. And every day you wake up, be productive. Now unto him, who is able to keep us from falling, able to present us faultless before his throne. With exceeding joy. Both now and forevermore. Be glory, majesty, dominion. Let the people of God say, Amen.